I read a book last month entitled, The Explosive Child. Now this isn't about the kids who occasionally throw a fussy pants party or even an in-your-face tantrum. No, these are the kids that, well, that very frequently and very easily, they explode with all kinds of emotion and physicality. And no amount of the normal sticks and carrots have really brought them under control. It's, it's really sad. And, and surprisingly, they, they know that it's disrupting this behavior of theirs. It's disrupting their family life and, and their classrooms. And to be honest, they feel badly about their explosions. But once their trigger is pulled, and it is easily pulled, why, you can expect for the next half hour, 45 minutes, an hour and a half or more of an over-the-top, irrational explosion of emotion, screaming, fits, and brawling, and cursing, and all kinds of awfulness that no amount of just being a better parent to that kid or, or showing him who's boss will ever rein them in. They lose it. They know they lose it. They're going to lose it again. And life is absolutely miserable for everyone. Their siblings are, are terrified of them. Their parents are at their wit's end. They're walking around on eggshells just not knowing what's going to be the next thing. Teachers dread them. But a really big change for the better came into the lives of some of these children and their parents. When somebody changed the explanation of why they behave so poorly without ever any improvement with normal discipline. Now to understand the explanation, you have to know the old explanation that it replaced. The old explanation we all know. You know, when you see a kid losing it in the store, just face down, throwing a tantrum, you know why. They didn't get what they want, did they? And they're letting the world know, and they, they are willfully and defiantly just making all this big scene because they want to. You see, the, the old explanation went this way, that kids can do well when they want to. And if that's the explanation, you kind of go after the kid with that. You know, well, I'm bigger. I will, I will tame this horse. You know, because we can't have this going on the rest of your life. But for a certain amount of kids, there was no taming. And a new explanation was given. And it went like this. Children do well if they can. And this literally changed the lives of so many people. Now, the reason and the, the thinking behind this that, that the change came is that, you know, when a baby is born, right, they, they go through a natural developmental stage. And they start off in just learning how to walk, right? The, the, they have to kind of wiggle, and then they roll over, and then they, they learn how to use their legs, and they start crawling and cruising and walking and running. And with learning to speak, you know, they had to make sounds and, and gurgles and all kinds of little things. And then, oh, a word. And, and then they got a couple words. And then they got some grammar and some sentences. And then you can't make them stop talking. <laughs> now, if this normal development of a child happens, and they get to the stage where they should be walking, and they should be talking, and they're not... What's our normal explanation for that? It's not that this child's just trying to, to get us. It's not that they're trying to get attention or, or get their way. No, if they can't walk, that means they're not able to because they would if they could, right? And, and so normally when we see a child that should be walking, our response is compassion. And then we start trying to figure out how we're going to make it possible for them to walk. 
Well, some experts began to look at these children who just exploded. And they, they found out that in their brains, they, they think different. It works different up there for them. And that when their trigger is tripped, their brains stop functioning. They physically cannot think of any way out of what they've decided they're going to do or they must have in that moment. And as a parent then escalates the pressure to do something different, it's just, it's just fuel on the fire until the match. Kaboom! But when somebody said, children do well if they can, why, it opened up all new kinds of possibilities for parents and teachers, all new kinds of questions, as they realized, well, wait a minute, you mean my kid could be living life without explosions? But it's just not possible, so I got to think about, well, how can we make it possible to work with this child? And, and it just, and it wasn't easy. A lot of setbacks, took a lot of patience. But finally, amazingly, miraculously, it began to really improve their lives. All because at the very beginning, the explanation was changed. Children do well if they can. I'm going to suggest that this isn't true for just a few select explosive children. I'm going to suggest it's true for me. And you. I want to suggest that this is in fact true for absolutely every person on the face of the planet Earth. That we do well if we can. Now let that soak in for a moment because it, it should disturb you a little bit. It's like, hmm, you can't fix that problem that quickly just by saying that explanation. It doesn't work that way. In fact, I'm just surprised there hasn't been somebody like an educator maybe a counselor, stand it up, go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not true. People willfully make bad choices. They, they willfully do lots of bad things. And then somebody from Sunday school could stand up and say, yeah, and they do bad things because they're sinners. Right. And I, I have no, no qualm. We were saying that we're sinners. We were born sinners. We're sinners sitting in this chair right now. In this room, we're, we're going to be sinners until we die. We, we, are, we are sinners, and, and yes, people do choose to do some pretty bad things. Where I want to tease this out is to understand, well, why are we sinners? You might think, well, we're sinners because we do bad things. You know, people make bad choices. They could do good, but they do bad. That's not why we're sinners. The reason that we are sinners is because we do not have the ability before God to do well. We don't. And it's not just me saying it or psychologists or experts who've studied people. Uh, that's what St. Paul said in our epistle reading today. He said there are certain people, and we're going to call them Gentiles, but it's really anybody who doesn't have God in their life. The brain doesn't work right. It's, it's off base. And, and their hearts are hardened and they're basically being led by their deceitful desires and all kinds of sensuality and greed. They have no other choice. This is what they do. And that's what he said in Ephesians 4, 17. He says, The Gentiles, in the futility of their thinking, they're darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. But if it's true that we can do well if we can, that we will do well if we can, if that's true, well then, a whole new possibility has been opened up to us. A whole new life has been given because before it just wasn't possible. But now, this new thing has been given to us. And this new life is the, the very life that we've been taught in Jesus. You see, it's more than just Jesus died for us and he rose again to take away our sins. When Jesus rose from the dead, he opened up a whole new creation that began at Easter with the resurrection of his body. His body was all brand new. 
And now, this new life is being given to more and more people, and it's, you don't have to wait till heaven for it to take effects. But it's available right now. Listen to Paul write about this. He says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created in God, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This new life in which you now can be righteous and holy, now has been given to you, and it came to you at a very specific time in which you can verify it. It came to you when you were baptized. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you were buried, your old self, the new self was given life with Jesus as he has risen from the dead, so now you have a new life. And now this new life with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, here's what's available to you in this new life. Paul says, now you can put off speaking lies to one another. And you can, you can act appropriately with your anger. You don't have to keep a grudge. And uh, you can actually use your mouth and your hands for really good things, helpful for one another. And inside of your heart that used to burn with bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and, and now whole new life of love, compassion, and the love of God. You're this dearly loved child. Isn't this extremely good news for the people of the earth that this new life is now available Imagine the difference it's going to make then just in the congregation as people actually live this new life. You see, the, the, the explosive children and their parents, they never assumed that this new way of life for them meant that they were ever going to do it perfectly. You know, that was never the goal or even the assumption. They, they'd take a couple steps forward and they'd have to go one back and, and they'd get stuck in a corner and they'd have to have help getting out. But... They had to work really hard for every gain that they made and they put the effort in. But just because they'd never become perfect at it didn't mean this whole new life was available to them. You see, as St. Paul lays out this new life for the Christian, it's not about being perfect. St. Paul is very aware that all the good that I would do, I don't do. Evil is right there with me. But that doesn't mean that the new life isn't here. And because of this new life, he can speak very strongly to us. I insist on it. You must. It's, it's kind of like the rehab therapist with the, teaching the person to walk again after a stroke. They can be kind of hard on them, right? Because your body is going to be able to walk again, but we, we got to work at it. You know, you got to get out of this wheelchair. We now have a life that can walk with the Lord. We have a heart that can love. We have a mind that doesn't have to harbor the bitterness. The reason there is such this long list of the old to the new is so that you and I might look deeply into our lives and realize this long life of, of thinking it was normal to harbor a grudge, to think it's normal to be bitter and to have certain people that, well, I'm just not going to forgive them. To think that it's normal that, well, uh, I can just withdraw from this person or that family member. Here the Holy Spirit is working to give us a new heart, a new life in Jesus. Now, those parents of the explosive children, they, they'd be the first to admit there's no way they could have done this on their own. There's no way they could have figured it out. They really needed the help. Somebody to guide them around the pitfalls. Somebody to keep encouraging them. You can do this. Somebody to instruct them, well, what's the next step? I don't know. See, the teacher, Jesus, who has risen from the dead 2,000 years ago, is still your teacher now. 
He has given you His Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't keep living as if you don't have this new life. The Holy Spirit is with you to give you this next step. The Scriptures are your instructions. The church is your encouragement. This new life is now possible. And we can do well with Jesus, our teacher, the Spirit leading us. Now, there is, is so much more to be said about this new life. And I really want to have the time to do it other than a sermon. That's the reason I want to extend this invitation to you to come follow Jesus. September 25th and 26th, we're going to go to the Catholic Retreat Center. And we're going to spend just time with Jesus, learning from Him what it means to truly live as His people with this new life. And the bitterness and the rage and the unforgiveness. But living now in true love and tenderness for this other human being that beforehand I could only think of as an enemy. You see, this retreat isn't about learning new prayers or new ways to worship. It's about living your normal life at work and at home or wherever you're at as somebody who has a new life in Jesus. Let's pray.